Let's bring in our guests now from London. We have former Kremlin advisor Alexander Nekrasov. In Tel Aviv, we have Mayor Javed Anfar. He's the owner and editor of the Iran Israel Observer. From Tehran, we have Mohammed Marandi. He's a professor at Tehran University. And with me here in the studio is journalist and Middle East correspondent Borzu Daragahi. Gentlemen, I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Let me start with you, Borzu. So, no deal between Israel and Russia to pull Iranian forces out of Syria. That's what we're hearing. Do you believe that? Uh, I think that there probably is no deal. There's no deal per se. I think that uh, Russia is playing a very tough game of trying to keep uh, uh, rival partners sort of happy, uh, probably telling each constituency what they think that they want to hear, uh, and, and sort of juggling these different interests and so on. So it's very possible that uh, Russia, in its confusion and rush to uh, tone down tempers, and so on, uh, just keeps telling people what they want to hear. Okay, so juggling rival partners. Alexander Nekrasov, is that how it is? Does Russia have two mistresses in this conflict? Well, Russia has more than that. Russia has problems with other sides involved in this. Americans, the Saudis especially, uh, with the Turks, there is an understanding. Of course, no troops will be pulled out at once, but there was an agreement with Lieberman in Moscow that the Iranian uh, militias uh, and, 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 and some of the uh, troops will be at least 20 miles away uh, from the uh, battlefield when this operation to destroy, finally, the last remnants of ISIS and other groups uh, in the north uh, bordering Israel will start. So that's a good turn. And there was an understanding reached when Netanyahu was in Moscow on the May uh, celebrations of Victory Day that uh, with Putin, that uh, the R Russians will do everything. Russia will do anything, everything possible to keep these Iranians mm -hmm. at bay and not let them move to Israeli t uh, the borders. That is very important. I don't think uh, you should no ignore this. And I think generally we should understand something. Everybody keeps on banging on how disastrous the situation in Syria is, how long the conflict is. We should thank Russia, uh, Turkey, and Iran for restraint and, and for basically preventing this war becoming a regional war. Israel played a key part in that as well. And unfortunately, the Americans didn't do much to help with okay. that. So I, I, I think, yeah, fair in, enough. Okay, in a but sense, I, this is a big success. I don't think many people can find the silver linings that you are finding, but I think that's almost a separate conversation. Let me bring in uh, Mohammed Marandi. Mohammed Marandi, when we have Israel's defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, saying publicly, tweeting and so forth, that the, the, um, the Russians understand Israel's security concerns. How do the Iranians feel? Do the, do the Iranians feel that perhaps they're losing Russian support? No. First of all, I think we have to keep in mind that the Israeli regime is very dishonest. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago when they attacked Syrian government positions, they claimed that they struck Iranian targets and that they destroyed 80 percent of Iran's infrastructure in the south of Syria, whereas there, were abs there was not a single Iranian there. There wasn't an, even, an Iranian even injured. Uh, there, were, there were no facilities there. They fabricated the story in the m mainstream media in the West. They basically mimicked what the Israelis said. So anything that the Israelis say, I, I take with a, a great deal of caution. Uh, on the other hand, the Iranian-Russian relationship is very good. The Iranians and the Russians together have pushed back ISIS and Al-Qaeda across the board. Recently, the Americans like to take credit for what happened, but without a doubt, they had very little role to play in anything. In fact, they helped create these extremist groups. So the Iranians, the Russians helped the Syrian government, along with Hezbollah. They helped the Syrian government and the Iraqi government to push back the extremists. Now. The important thing to keep in mind, though, is that Iran is in Syria at the request of the Syrian government. And Iran's presence in Syria is, uh, therefore, based on the de needs and the demands of the Syrian government. In the West, they like to say, they like to exaggerate the numbers of Iranian uh, soldiers there. They like to say that Iran is in control. That's not the reality on the ground. I've okay. been to Syria okay. uh, at least nine or ten times during the past few years. And it's very clear that it's the Syrian government that's in control, and the Iranians are right. there 
uh, to help to meet their needs, and not while, to meet Iran's certainly, needs. Certainly, and while they are there at the invitation of Bashar al-Assad's regime, that does not necessarily mean that they aren't also doing terrible things. A lot of actors doing terrible things in Syria right now. Let me bring in Mayor Javid Anfer from the Israeli. No, they aren't doing terrible things. They are. No, they aren't doing any terrible. They are. Things. Okay, okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna. They are ask... fighting extremists. Okay. They're fighting the extremists that okay, the United I'll States, Al Qaeda, and ISIS created. Okay, I'll get in a response. Country. I'll get a response we from one of the other guests later on. I'll get a response from Borzu uh, to that in a moment. But let me ask you, Marja Vidanfer, for the Israelis, even though there might not be a deal on paper, as was initially reported, is the best deal uh, for the Israelis going to be that? Okay, no deal on paper, but. Any time you feel you want to take out any Iranian threat, the Russians are going to let you bomb in that part of Syria, and you can sort, sort it out that way. Is that the best deal for the Israelis right now? Well, Imran, that seems to be the situation right now. We have a very close coordination with the Russian government. We have a direct red line. And the Russians uh, are coordinating uh, security-wise with Israel in terms of aerial attacks. And for now, it seems that, yes, for now, the Israeli Air Force, whenever the Iranian regime forces or re Iranian regime-affiliated forces are threatening Israel, they are attacking. And, uh, and uh, thanks to this close coordination, the Russians have never come to the uh, support or to the defense of the Iranian regime forces. But... I think in the long run, what Israel is hoping is that um, Syria does not become a new base for the Iranian regime and its allies to uh, threaten Israel. Of course, it's Bashar al-Assad who supports, who, is, who rules Syria. Um, but the man in charge really today is Vladimir Putin. So Israel is, develop, is, close very, is developing very close relations with, uh, with Vladimir Putin. And for now, we see that, yes, uh, we have, uh, we, the Israeli Air Force seems to have carte blanche in terms of wanting to attack uh, the Iranian regime and its affiliates. Um, what will happen in the future? I think they're working on a deal to make sure that there is an understanding between us and the Russians in terms of what happens for the future of Syria. The Iranian regime right. doesn't like it. Well, we know the Iranian regime says that it doesn't have any forces there, but that, that doesn't make a difference. Right. I think Israel is working very closely with Russia and, of course, with the Americans to find an arrangement, long-term arrangement. Mayor, let me ask you something, something that was mentioned by Mohammed Marandi, which is the idea that the Israelis prefer jihadis like the Nusra Front on the border, Sunni extremists, rather than any Iranian influence. Is that a fair accusation? That is a ridiculous accusation coming from Mr. Marandi, who believes that ISIS was established by America and that Al-Qaeda was established uh, by the West as well. This is completely ridiculous. Okay. Mr. Mirandi, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that in a moment, but I want Burzu Daragahi to respond to something you said a bit earlier on. Burzu, you've reported on the ground from Syria. You've reported yeah. on this, this long war throughout its evolution to the point that the Iranians haven't done any terrible things in Syria. You would respond what? Well, I, I think that there's no really honorable players when it comes to mm -hmm. Syria. Um, I don't think that anyone has played a great role, uh, but I think that, you know, the, the majority of the crimes and atrocities against civilians have been committed by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. I think that's been proven countless times by independent organizations. And to the extent that the, uh, 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 the Iranian government has supported Bashar al-Assad, it is complicit, as is the Russian uh, government as well in those crimes. I'm not saying that the, you know, the rebels were faultless. I can also point to long stretches of the conflict. Mm -hmm. the, Dr. Marandi was saying that they were fighting ISIS. They were not fighting ISIS for very long stretches. The regime, the Iranians, it was most of the war, during the entirety of the war, 2012, when the Lebanese Hezbollah and the Iranians got really involved, they were fighting against Syrian rebels, including moderate rebel groups, Islamist rebel groups, uh, maybe occasionally against Nusra as well, quite fiercely. But very rarely did the Syrian regime or its Iranian allies and militia partners fight against ISIS. That was a fight that was led mostly by Syrian rebels and the, uh, the Kurds, the uh -huh. SDF forces backed by the U.S. Mr. Mirandi, why is it so hard to admit that the Iranians also have blood on their hands when it comes to Syria? A lot of other actors do. Well, they don't. And, and the narrative that your uh, guess is pursuing is one of nonsense. First of all, Hezbollah entered Syria in 2013, well after tens of thousands of foreign fighters were inside the country. ISIS was doing heavy trade 
with uh, neighboring countries' oil trade, that it was the, and the Russians were the ones who actually bombed those ten thousands of tens of thousands of tankers that were doing the trade, and the Americans who were flying over those tankers were doing nothing for a long period of time. The reason, of course, why the focus was not on ISIS for a period of time was because they were in the east of the country. And by the way, according to the Defense Intelligence Agency documents of 2012, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, the United States knew from early on that the dominant fighting force, they were not moderates, they were extremists, and that they were funded by neighboring countries. And the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency at that time, the famous General Michael Flynn, later on Al Jazeera of all places, admitted that the United States took a willful decision to support the extremists in Syria, who wanted to create a Salafist state, as stated in the document, between Syria and Iraq. Who occupied that area? It was ISIS. So I think it's quite clear with regards to the Israeli regime. And I can go further. For example, the leaked document, okay, but, the leaked but don't. audio clip I'll tell you why, because uh, for brevity. Kerry, Okay. Who admitted that the United States. I, I, I know you understand. For brevity, I want to I want to jump in here, and I don't mean to be rude to you. I know you understand. I want to bring everybody in. I want to bring in Alexander Nekrasov here, and your point was well made. I want to bring in Alexander Nekrasov to ask, what does Putin want right now? Okay, we're in 2018. We're halfway through 2018. The Russians are calling the shots in many ways. Now what? What's it going to do with Syria? Well, there's a lot of work to do still, because don't forget, in Idlib, there are about, what, 30,000 uh, so-called rebels who are actually uh, ISIS and uh, al-Nusra terrorists, and they need to be dealt with. And uh, until they exist on the territory of Syria, uh, we don't really have an opportunity to discuss any peaceful solutions or political solutions. Now, I'd like to point out that some of your guests uh, who are pro-Western, they use this typical uh, method of uh, uh, saying a propaganda slogan and thinking that it reflects the reality on the ground. You can't do that. You can't blame Iran and, and uh, Bashar Assad all the time for getting your old sins. Don't forget Iraq and Libya, by the way, and how the West handled yeah, them. We're, we're not about talking about Iraq and when Libya. This has, yeah. this, no, this has to stop. This has to stop. You can't talk Look, in these I PC mean, the Russian, slogans the Russian regime and, and protect, has, has and protect no, no, excuse civilian me, let me finish. throughout let me Syria. Finish. I did and not, now they're saying I did not that they want to do the same you. thing in Idlib province, which no, 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 no. is many, you, many you civilians. He just said, basically, people. that this you war is not, not going to have a political solution you, no, excuse until me. we I'm bomb worried about the American regime in Raqqa. You, you okay. are not... Well, okay, uh, Mr. Nekrasov, finish your point. These are propaganda. American regime bombing Raqqa. Okay, finish your point, Mr. Nekrasov. No, it's, it's, how can I finish when this propagandist immediately interferes? That's the way they do it. They shout you down. They stop you. They don't allow you. They lie. Anyone. They ignore facts. You, you ignore facts. You lie. You lie blatantly on this channel, and you st seem to think that we are all idiots and are going to buy this. I'm, so, I'm sorry. This doesn't I, work I think that like that. An you have to understand the situation on the ground. Issues, he can, on the ground, but you he's don't now understand me the situation. Of being a propagandist. I don't know what else. I think yes, that's not a very civilized form of debate. Yes, you are a propagandist because you can't. You I think can't that you make need to up. go back to wherever institution you came from and learn well, how you, to you behave politely. Well, you can't shock me. You, you, okay. you, know, you, no, let me give, okay, you let have me give to, Mr. to learn some manners. Okay, Mr. Nekrasov, let me give you 30 well, seconds to wrap up. I'll tell you what. You know what? We're going to bring in somebody else in the next minute. And one of the reasons why I have to thank you in a minute and bring him in is because he didn't want to appear on the panel with you because the last time you called him lots of names and called him an extremist and a terrorist. So. Mr. Nekrasov, 30 seconds, please, to finish your point before I bring in Yahya Leridi. Mr. Nekrasov, go ahead. Well, I suggest that next time we have a debate on this issue, people come in who know what's going on on the ground, who don't use propaganda, and who don't uh, shout and stop other people talking, because this is not a debate. This is just shouting and screaming and, and, and propagandist slogans. That's what I mean. And that's why, by the way, in Syria, there was a problem. And when you say, what does Putin want? Putin wants to find some sort of a solution where people do not hide their real agendas and accuse others of, okay. of committing, a, well, as we heard today, question. crimes. OK, no, I'm glad you answered my question. And I thank you very much for joining us here on the program, Alexander Nekrasov. We say goodbye to you, and we thank you sincerely for joining us. Now we welcome Yahya Laridi. He's a spokesman for the Opposition Syrian Negotiations uh, Commission. Yahya Laridi, you've been listening to the rest of the program. Let me ask you, as a Syrian, as the Syrian on the panel, 
Tell me what's your take on the past 15 minutes. Well, uh, good evening to you and to your guests. Uh, actually, I wanted really uh, to avoid uh, this uh, type of uh, propaganda happening, accusing others of propaganda, but uh, just doing it uh, himself. Uh, I wanted to be with him, but uh, on conditions that uh, things are quite polite and uh, normal. Uh, actually, uh, Russia says continuously uh, that it is being invited by a legitimate government in Syria. Actually, uh, a government loses its uh, legitimacy immediately when it uh, shoots its people, when it destroys them, when it displaces half of the country, and when it has almost half a million people in its jail. Uh, for Russia, it seems that uh, the 22.9 20, uh, 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 million uh, Syrians are uh, either ISIS or Nusra or uh, uh, extremists or terrorists. The only exception to that is that the party that invited it to come to Syria. So, uh, Russia came to Syria with the airplanes, with jets, destroying uh, markets, destroying uh, hospitals and these things. But now Russia is in a hurry, in a tense situation. It want, it's, it's after finding a political solution. It wants to get the fruit of the three months promised by Putin that he would settle the issue there. Now right. it is three months, but three years. What your guests are saying about this issue is that now we have a conflict between the parties who came, as they say, upon the invitation of the legitimate government. Actually, we wish that the Iranians were there, the Russians were there, just to respond to people's wishes, to people's demands early on that they wanted some freedom. On the contrary to that, they just responded to what the regime wanted. It wanted to stay on that bloody chair only. And we wanted them. And now we are creating another problem, creating a problem for us with Israel. Now Israel is using Iran as a pretext to pass that resolution in the Knesset. It was uh, the one that passed was passed in 1981, and it was considered by the Security Council as null and void. It wanted to have control over the Syrian-occupied Golan Heights under the pretext of the existence of Iran there. So right. The Syrian uh, land is being used let, as That's a, a good point. Let me ask... Interest okay, interesting point. Let me, let me ask Mayor Javidan for, do you see it as cynically as that? Knesset's passing through this motion in order to entrench occupation in order to say, hey, there's Iranian influence in Golan Heights, let's rubber stamp this and let's make this our land for good? I think what's happening in Israel is that um, even people who supported uh, the peace deal with Syria, and make no mistake, the Golan Heights is occupied territory. We didn't receive it as, as part of a Hanukkah present. Uh, it is occupied territory. However, there are increasing number of Israelis who look at the Golan Heights, they look at what's happening in Syria. They see a regime that's not afraid to use chemical weapons against its own people. And the, the concern is that if we ever return that land to, to the Syrian regime, then the same regime could threaten us. So I think this seems to be the, 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 legit, the, the legitimate argument in Israel, which seems that there's not a lot of opposition to it in this country, even, even by people who usually oppose Netanyahu. Okay, so Mohammed Marandi, the Israelis need to defend their borders no matter what. The Iranians are fiddling. Yes, I know. It's like the chemical weapons in Jerusalem, too. The Palestinians are threatening the Israelis with nuclear and chemical weapons. That's why they chose Jerusalem as their capital and they're annexing the West Bank because probably there are chemical weapons hidden there as well. Maybe later, later on in Jordan, they may find chemical weapons, too, so that they can take more territory from there. Obviously, it's nonsense. Just like the fact that... Um, uh, the Israeli regime is not helping the extremists. We know that ISIS is on the border between Israeli regime troops, which is occupying uh, Syria since many decades ago. The, the ISIS is on the border. They are on between Syrian troops and the Israeli regime forces. But the Israeli regime does nothing against them. They've been there for years. Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, they are helped by the Israeli regime. And just recently... Uh, people have been sentenced by uh, Druze for uh, protesting and, and killing one of the uh, Nusra or Al-Qaeda militants that were being taken by an uh, ambulance to an Israeli regime hospital. 
So the Israeli Mr. regime is helping Al Qaeda, okay, as the former head of Mossad admitted. Okay. They tolerate ISIS and they bomb Syria. Can I get so you to wrap really up? Can I get you to wrap it, uh, Borzu? We're we're wrapping in a minute, so Borzu, very briefly, please, and then I'll get some final thoughts from Yahya. Borzu. I mean, this is a very tough situation right now that is taking place in Syria. Uh, the, I don't really think the Russians know what they're doing. And I think that the best way to think of Russia right now is as a bumbling superpower that has entered the fray into a very complex Middle East situation and is trying to manage various parts, is not doing a very good job of it, is telling the Israelis what they want to hear, telling the Iranians what they want to hear, telling the regime of Bashar al-Assad what it wants to hear, perhaps telling the White House what it wants to hear. And that's a very dangerous mm -hmm. recipe right now because Russia doesn't have any leverage over any of these players. So the Iranians could be like saying, sure, we'll leave the border area. Meanwhile, send guys in. Mm -hmm. uh, the Syrians could be telling them, yeah, 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 we're telling the Iranians to get out. And they're you know, not telling the Iranians to get out. And that's a recipe for accident and miscalculation and uh, potentially cataclysmic war. Yeah, yeah. Some people see the Russian influence as a stabilizing influence, no matter how ugly the players are, no matter how many people Bashar al-Assad has killed. They say, well, Russia's sorting it out. It's not absolute Armageddon and absolute chaos. Your response to that is what? We wish uh, Russia would be a stabilizing factor in Syria. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Russia is trying to sell the Syrian card to several parties, uh, to the Israelis, to the Americans, to the uh, Iranians, etc., and even to, to, to the Turks. Uh, although Turkey is a, a neighbor and is hosting Syrians over three million, which is uh, something appreciated by all Syrians, that's one thing. Another thing. Uh, if uh, Russia wanted now to settle the uh, issue between Iran and Israel, Iran actually, uh, from the from the early days of the Khomeini, it just assigned itself as the custodian for uh, for, uh, for for uh, Jerusalem, and uh, it just denied Muslims and Arabs of that uh, right. Of, no, it never did any such thing. It, of course it's not. Close it's a close to the now to the Israeli border due to the fact that. As Syria is devastated and, there, and, and nobody is, is fighting it. Now, uh, uh, being in that particular position, uh, just would, uh, uh, Iran thinks that this would give it some sort of a credit that it is the leader of resistance and uh, steadfastness. No, Iran is in Syria because the United States proof. has helped to destroy the country, and the United, Iran is there to push back. The extremists, the black flags would be in Damascus. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for the Americans, we wouldn't have, have had this mess lie. in the first place. Do you see, we wouldn't have be, had, had be, Iranians to, in Syria. An and we have an American Israel. force occupying the country without the permission no, 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 of any no, no. government. Okay, I'm in the, I'm in the horrible position of having to stop all of you because we're completely out of time. But I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Yahya Laridi, Mohammed Marandi, Mayor Javid Anfer. Rosu Daragahi and earlier Alexander Nekrasov. Gentlemen, there's a lot more to say because of the very nature of this conflict. Hope to have you all on the program again. Thank you very much.